Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Paula Hawkins is the author of A Slow Burning Fire, a novel. Paula worked as a journalist for 15 years before turning her hand to fiction. She is the author of two number one New York Times bestselling novels, Into the Water and The Girl on the Train. An international number one bestseller, The Girl on the Train has sold over 23 million copies worldwide and has been adapted into a major motion picture, which I saw. Hawkins was born in Zimbabwe and now lives in London, Welcome, Paula. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss a slow fire burning. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. By the way, right yesterday, it came out as, I think, a Amazon book club and Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Is that what it was? You may well be right. I, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I think that sounds right. Okay. Well, whatever. It sounded good. So good news is <laughs> all around. <laughs> Paula, I know you're a wonderful, established, best-selling author already because of your other books, but would you mind telling listeners what A Slow Fire Burning is about? So it's a story of revenge, deceit, and murder, inevitably. And at the heart of it, there's three very intriguing women who may or may not be involved. So the the novel opens with a body is discovered on a houseboat on the Regent's Canal in London, and a woman is seen in the vicinity, and she has blood on her clothing, and this is a woman who has a tr- has a troubled past. She's got a history of violence. It looks like an open and shut case, but of course it is not. There are a number of mysteries interlinked, a number of, uh, of people who are connected to the, to the young man who's been killed. And yes, a slow unraveling of loads of past tragedies and past traumas over the course of the novel. Well, it really opens with an excerpt from a book and the person nice. reading the book, which was <laughs> very, I always love these sort of like, you're in a book, but now you're pre- you're pretending to be somebody who's also reading a book, sort of meta references. That was great. <laughs> yes, there is also, yeah, there's a novel within a novel and I managed to have quite a bit of fun with that too. So. Wow. I also, I loved in your opening how there's this outreach, right? A girl in desperate need reaches out to her dad and the mom is like, no, sorry, we're too busy playing bridge. And as someone whose mom is often too busy playing bridge, I must say, <laughs> This struck quite quite a chord. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a lot of quite bad parenting going on in this novel. But yes, the so Laura is slightly let down by her parents, just to say, to say the least. Yes, we'll just <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Not to say my mom's a bad parent; she would. Care. Oh, sorry, no, yes, she's no, a great no parent. No shade to your mom. <laughs> but there is bad parenting in the book, and you know these <laughs> cries for help when sometimes the people who you who you most want to hear you might not listen. Or you know. absolutely, yeah. And then of course you have this discovery where the woman who finds the body is all of a sudden, you know, throwing up on the deck and, you know, feels terrible about that and starts getting questioned. And it leads you off onto this, you know, who done it essentially, what happened hell, which draws you right in. Fantastic. Yes. Yes. So that the, the, a neighbor discovers the body and we, I mean, I think we, she's immediately an intriguing character, the, the character of Miriam, but she's definitely not what she first appears. There's, there are layers to Miriam and she's quite a, she's quite a dark person actually. So speaking of being a dark person, what is, <laughs> what draws you to all of these stories that have the same sort of undercurrents of mystery and murder and intrigue? And how did you start even doing all this? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because i I have always liked darker stories. Even from childhood, I enjoyed sort of darker fairy tales. I I was intrigued by stories of murder and mayhem. And I I have no idea where that comes from, but it's that's part of my sensibility. I've always enjoyed reading that kind of thing as a child. I really loved Agatha Christie. I loved the I loved the puzzle of a, of a mystery novel. And then you know later on, I got into things like Donna Tartt, The Secret History, which and that was it was all the psychological stuff that was going on in the background, which I absolutely loved. I've always just enjoyed those kind of you know books. They don't it's not necessarily crime novels, but novels with a crime at their heart, even if they're sort of a literary fiction or, or I'd like war novels as well. For some reason, 
trauma, give me trauma, give me tragedy, and I'm I'm hooked. So that's just that's the way the way my mind works, and I I really can't tell you why. Well, that's all right. Nobody really <laughs> understands themselves deep down, oh, right? We're all just like a mismatch of random things. I loved like everybody else in the world, probably the girl on the train and, you know, haven't stopped thinking about that particular <laughs> story. When you come up with these ideas and characters in particular, what comes first? Are you, do you think of the characters or do you think of the plot and how do you go about the books? Like, where do you start? It definitely start with character. So the girl on the train very much came from Rachel. Rachel's character I've been thinking about for a long time, about a, a woman who had a drink problem. And, and the, mem- the memory loss was the thing that really intrigued me. It was like, if you can't remember what you've done, that opens up all kinds of possibilities and it also affects how you feel about your actions. You feel not responsible enough or too responsible and you can be manipulated really easily. It just opens up all sorts of different avenues. In this novel, I started with Laura, who's had an accident as a child and as a result has some behavioural problems. But again, it's 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 what that means for her. Like, how does she navigate the world? How does she deal with the fact that people judge her really unfairly sometimes? And, she, you know, she sometimes reacts in ways that she can't really help and then fights all sorts of trouble on down on her own head. So it's these characters who are at once kind of troubled, maybe problematic, but also vulnerable and raw and have, you know, for me, I still love these characters. I think they they have goodness in them. They're not, they're not like bad people. They're just people to whom terrible things keep happening, sometimes from their own bad choices, but not always. Sometimes they're just, you know, they're just unlucky. So having written these successful books in the past, when you sit down to write A Slow Fire Burning, like, were you nervous about it at all? Or do you ever think to yourself, like, I hope I can do it again? Or are you just like, okay, here we go? I mean, yeah, there are so, so many moments of self-doubt in an, in, in, over the process of writing a novel. You, you know, it takes a long time. This one took over two years. Um, so there are so many moments at which you think, oh, this is terrible. Or, oh, I can't finish this. Or I don't know where this is going. Or So I think it's it's not... It's not just one moment, it's many moments. And then there'll be times when you're like, oh, yes, thank you. This is amazing. This is really working. And then, you know, so it's it's kind of a roller coaster for me anyway, that you have moments where you're loving it and it's working and you really believe in it and moments where you just want to throw your hands up in the air. And all I can say is you just have to push through. It's a long slog writing a novel. It's a marathon, definitely. And how do you go about sort of dealing with your the rest of your life when you're so immersed in the characters and the writing, like on a good day or a bad day, when you shut down the laptop or, you know, walk away from the desk and then have to re-enter sort of the real world. Do you ever have trouble with that? You know, I, I don't, but I think I am, well, I guess I, because I don't have a family, I don't have kids. I don't have, so I don't have to take care of anyone else. Like, I can, I just take care of me, (laughs) which just sounds really sad, but no, I think I can be quite work obsessed at certain times. I can find it a bit difficult to leave it behind, but yeah, I think you just have to go with your own rhythm. I think it's very different for people who who are taking, you know, I don't, I don't know how people cope when they have three children at home as well. I just don't really understand how that works. I have four children. Oh my goodness. (laughs) But plenty, plenty of people do. Most of my writer friends have kids and manage just fine. But for me, it's like a mystery. I'm not saying I manage fine at all. I did not say that. I just said I had the kids. (laughs) Quite a different story. Yes. Well, still, I feel like a lot of times different creative outlets can help in the writing process. Like, do you have anything else you go to? Do you like to even just like taking a walk or something like that or photography or I don't know. I feel like there's this big intersection Mm. of both creativity and anxiety that (laughs) feeds novels. There's a lot of walking goes on, yes, definitely, particularly over the past couple of years where everything's been shut down and we didn't have a lot of other outlets because generally I do like going to museums and art galleries and that kind of thing and that I find very inspiring to look like visual arts. That helps me a lot, but it hasn't really been possible so much because of the pandemic. But so, yeah, lots of walks. I, I read a lot. I simply just go in. I often, if I'm struggling with a novel, I'll go back to old favorites and just read novels that I've loved 
and kind of remind myself why it is I want to do this. You know, I go back, My one of my favourite authors is Kate Atkinson. She writes literary, crime, uh, literary novels and crime novels. And I just, I can get immersed in her books and sort of make me feel better and then, you know, reinvigorate my, my desire to write. But yes, I think, I think being out in nature is really helpful. So going for long walks, being in beautiful surroundings, that kind of thing. Not in London, clearly, but, you know, if you can get away. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time in Scotland over the past year or so. So that's been very inspirational for me too, yeah. Wow. And are you you already at work on your next novel? No, not really. I mean, I've got, there are characters, there are people marching around in my head who will hopefully come to the page at some point. Well, soon, hopefully soon. I mean, I've I've got a lot of interviewing to do at the moment, but I'm hoping very soon to get to get back to it. I've, I've left it a bit too long. So it's okay. You'll get there. It's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> and is this going to be a movie also? There's nothing concrete announced yet, but I'm yeah, fingers crossed. I'd love to see it on screen. Yeah. So are you if you could go back to yourself in college, for instance, like would you be surprised where you are today? Or is this like, to- yeah. like, what were you like then? Like, what were you studying? And would this have been a natural extension of that? Well, no, I wanted to be a journalist, which I was for, for a while. So I, I studied politics, philosophy and economics. And I I went into journalism and I, I was a financial journalist. I was on the business desk at the Times for a long time. I would never have imagined myself. I would have loved, I would have been very happy. But I wouldn't <laughs> have imagined myself um, as, a, as a fiction writer. I just, I don't know. I never even, can, I, I mean, I loved writing stories, but I didn't really think of it as a practical career path. And I'm quite a practical person. So it just, yeah, it didn't. I didn't know anyone who wrote fiction. I'd never met anyone who wrote fiction. I didn't mix in those kind of circles, I guess. So it was, yeah, it, I would be very pleased with myself, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think, why don't, you, why don't you write serious books? <laughs> oh, please. Uh, oh, I was a very serious young woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then if you were in this sort of headspace, then what, cha- like, what made you try it? Did you take a well, class? Like, how did you get so good at it? I didn't take a class. I was, so I wrote a nonfiction book, just a money book, a financial guide. And as a result, I had an agent and my agent, we talked about the possibility of me writing fiction. I said that I liked doing it, but I, you know, I, she was always like, well, show me some of your stuff. And I was always like, oh no, I don't have anything ready. And then she said, she approached me because a publisher had come to her and said they want they sort of had an idea but they didn't have some, anyone to write it so it was kind of a weird situation where I almost kind of ghost wrote something it was a romantic comedy thing that I wrote under a pseudonym and so it was quite interesting because it was it didn't come from me the idea wasn't mine the character wasn't mine so I had this distance between me and it and I didn't feel it didn't feel so exposing because so it was kind of like a journalistic commission they just said go away and write this thing. And I did. And I mean, I I wrote four novels like this under a pseudonym and none of them did particularly well. Some of them did okay, but they were great in terms that they gave me a chance to like try out you know, different ways of character development and structuring a novel and how I liked to, you know, to how I like to actually tell a story. And yet with this distance of not putting my heart and soul on the page, it was a weird kind of convoluted circuitous route but for, for me it really worked hmm. I wonder if there's some way to you know give everybody an assignment right like ghost write this here's your job yeah. right? like instead of just waiting for inspiration maybe the writing class well, I think assign I think sometimes you should maybe don't try writing something that I mean, obviously you want to stay true to your character and your your stories and things. But I think for, for people who are very nervous, it might be helpful to try to sort of flex your fiction muscles by doing something a bit different, doing mm-hmm. something that you don't necessarily feel as strongly about. I don't recommend writing a whole novel that way, but, you know, some short stories, some just some scenes even where there's a, you have a bit more distance and you don't, it doesn't make, if it does, if you're one of those people who f- feels very nervous about it, and I did. I don't know. That might be terrible advice, but. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> That's great. So what do you want to happen now? Like you've achieved all this success. Like, do you feel good? Do you like, what, what do you, what's next? Like keep writing books or, and I don't just mean in like the here and now, like you have your, like life is spreading out. Like, do you have a bucket list? Like what's on your, not to ask a cliche question, but just, I don't know. What do you, do you want to travel? Like what's on your to-do list? 
I would love to travel right now, but obviously it's so difficult at the moment because of the pandemic. But yeah, so I, I would love to con- you know, continue to write novels. I have a, I would like one day to maybe try writing for the screen. So I've done like an online course, but I think I probably need to do a more rigorous course to to teach me how to write for for film or for television. I think it would be really fun to do something that's a bit more collaborative because obviously writing fiction is very, it's fairly solitary and that suits me most of the time, but I I quite like the idea of writing for the screen. Yeah, as soon as, well, if ever we are allowed to travel again, I would like to, I haven't been to the States for years, I'd like to go back to South America. I haven't seen my parents in two years. They live in Africa Aww. and I've not been able to see them. So that would that's going to be like first up when I get to travel. So yeah, lots, lots of things to look forward to. How did they end up in Africa? Oh, they've always lived there. So I grew up in Zimbabwe. Well, they've always lived there. My dad was born in, in England, but he, he was taken out there as, as a child. His father was an engineer working on a railway. So yeah, they've always lived there. Oh, very cool. All right. Who knew? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I know you've already included some advice for aspiring authors just as we've been chatting, but I always ask it at the end. Sorry. So do you have any sort of parting advice for aspiring authors? Well, I do think that what I did, I wasted a lot of time being locked in my own head because I never showed my work to anyone. I never shared my work and got feedback. And I and it is terrifying. I, I understand for a lot of people, it's very nerve wracking, but you've just got to get out there. Otherwise, I think you'll spend years locked up here and not and oh you could do and not getting out there and sharing your work and realizing that people can just tell you well that doesn't work but this does oh I love that character oh yes you know that character is amazing I love them and you won't know that until you've actually got a reader so join a writer's group or you know what have you share your work with it with a like-minded writer pal and I think that's it's incredibly helpful to do that and do it early not later I just finished writing something and I don't want to show anybody because just I'm like, do it. I'm like, I think I'd rather just show my editor and like, if everybody else hates it, like that's okay. Cause otherwise well, if you have, have to change it. <laughs> if you have an editor, that's wonderful because that person is like, you know, that's a professional person who can give their opinion. That's wonderful. If you, but if you don't, you know, a friend will have to do. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, it was lovely meeting you. Thank lovely you, Paula. To talk to you. Thank you. Enjoy your next walk. And you know, I hope you <laughs> get to travel soon. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 